Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of the newspaper analysis from the UPSC perspective. Today we have taken up important articles from the Hindu newspaper Delhi edition dated 17th March 2023. Topics for today's discussion are displayed on your screen. Let's begin the discussion. Now let's start our session with the first article which appeared on page number 5 in the Hindu newspaper. This article is about the dispute which is revolving around delay in constitution of Penaya Water Dispute Tribunal which was aimed to settle the conflict over construction across the Penaya River between the state of Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. So this dispute is between the state of Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. Also, Supreme Court in year 2022 gave three-month deadline to center to form a tribunal to settle the dispute. However, this deadline expired and Tamil Nadu state is awaiting union government's next course of action because efforts to settle the dispute through talks had failed already. Now, as interstate water disputes comes under the purview of separation of powers, that is 7th schedule, an interstate water disputes tribunal come under quasi-judicial bodies. So this theme is important under GS paper 2. Also, in year 2013, UPSC has framed question based on constitutional mechanism to resolve the interstate water disputes. Also, in year 2016, UPSC has asked you to write about water disputes between states in federal India. So with this, we can see that this theme is quite important. Now, in this discussion, we will look into what are interstate water disputes. Then next, we'll see constitutional and legal provisions for interstate water disputes. Then we'll discuss issues associated with interstate river water disputes. And we'll end our discussion with a way forward. So let's start our discussion. Now, to understand macro picture of interstate water disputes in India, first, let's quickly understand about Penaya River. Now, this Penaya Basin is the second largest interstate east flowing river basin among the 12 basins lying between the Penar and Kaveri basins. It covers a large area in the state of Tamil Nadu, besides the area covered in the states of Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. This Penaya River rises on the eastern slope of Nandi Drug mountain in the Chinna Kaseva hills of eastern Karnataka. And its major tributaries are Chinnar, Markanda, Vanya, and Pamban. So now let's see what is interstate water disputes. Now interstate water disputes in India arises when two or more states have conflicting claims over the use of a common river or water source. Why? Because water being a state subject. So each state has its own laws and policies related to the use of water resources. So what will happen? This often leads to disputes between neighboring states. There have been several interstate water disputes in India over the years. Some of the major disputes include Kaveri water dispute between Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, Krishna water dispute between Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka and Maharashtra, Godavari water dispute between Andhra Pradesh, Telangana and Maharashtra. Mahanadi water dispute between Chhattisgarh and Odisha. So these are important major interstate river disputes. Now let's see what are the mechanisms available to resolve interstate water dispute. Central government has set up a legal framework to resolve such disputes through Interstate River Water Disputes Act 1956. Now this act empowers the central government to set up a tribunal to resolve the dispute. Now this tribunal is headed by retired judge of Supreme Court or High Court and has the power to adjudicate the matter and make them binding recommendations. Now having seen an overview of interstate water disputes, now let's discuss what are constitutional and legal provisions for interstate river water disputes. Now in this the first is entry 17 of state list under 7th schedule. This deals with water, that is water supply, irrigation, drainage, embankments, water storage and water power. 
The next is entry 56 of union list which gives power to the union government. For what? For the regulation and development of interstate rivers and river valleys to the extent declared by parliament to be expedient in the public interest. The next is article 262 which deals with adjudication of disputes or complaint relating to waters of interstate rivers or valleys. The next is River Boards Act 1956. This provides for the establishment of river boards for the regulation and development of interstate rivers and river valleys. The next is which we have already discussed Interstate Water Disputes Act 1956 and this act empowers central government to set up tribunal for the adjudication of interstate river dispute. And you should remember that decision of the tribunal is final and binding on the parties to the dispute. Now one important fact which you should keep in your mind is that neither the Supreme Court nor any other court is to exercise jurisdiction in respect of any such dispute or complaint. Why I am asking you to remember this because this is one of the important reason behind issues associated with interstate river disputes. So now having seen constitutional and legal provisions for interstate river water disputes, now let's discuss some important issues associated with interstate river disputes. So now let's start with the issues. The first in this is judicial interventions. Why? Because Supreme Court interventions complicates the matter. Now with regard to the resolution process for interstate water disputes, Supreme Court has made interventions to adjudicate disputes, including enforcement of tribunal awards, holding that such disputes can be resolved under Article 131. Now why this is an issue? This we have already discussed that neither the Supreme Court nor any other court is to exercise jurisdiction in respect of any such dispute. Next is complex and opaque procedure. Why? Because of procedural complexities and incomplete nature of the system that involves multiple stakeholders across governments and agencies. This is a problem. Why? Because there are too many options and discretion at many stages in the institutional framework and guidelines process which hampers the efficient working or functioning of the tribunal itself. Next is political mobilization. Now interstate water dispute have become hugely politicized. This you can see with the help of example that the eruption of the Kaveri dispute framed as an ethnic identity issue between Tamilians and Kannadigas which led to widespread civil unrest. So what was the main issue? Main issue was the water dispute but how political mobilization portrayed it as an ethnic issue. Next challenge is insufficient data. Now absence of authoritative water data makes it difficult to even set up a baseline for adjudication. Also, it encompasses technological challenge. Why? Because managing water resources in a river basin involves the use of advanced technology such as remote sensing, modeling, simulation, etc. And however, many state governments lack the technological expertise to manage water resource effectively. So what will happen? These disputes over water resources often remain unresolved due to lack of unreliable data. Next is delay in dispute resolution. It's better to understand this point with the help of example. Godavari and Krishna disputes started around 1956 but the matter was referred to a tribunal only in year 1969. See the difference. Next is non-compliance. How this is an issue? Because there is no institutional mechanism for implementing tribunal's award. So what will happen many a time state governments have rejected tribunal award as there is no institutional mechanism. Next challenge is lack of grievances redressal. Now what is this? Delay deprives the states of an avenue to redress their grievances after the tribunals are dissolved. So when states approach to the Supreme Court in such instances, the bar on its jurisdiction 
puts restriction on the court. This we have already discussed. So what will happen? The Apex Court has had to limit its role to providing clarifications, leaving states discontent. So these are the important issues associated with interstate waiver disputes. Now, let's quickly discuss one recent development in this regard. That is an amendment that is Interstate Rio Water Disputes Amendment Bill 2019 to Interstate Water Disputes Act 1956, which was passed by the Lok Sabha in 2019, but it is yet to get the Rajya Sabha's nod. So what are its provisions? In this, when a state puts in a request regarding any water dispute, the central government will set up a DRC. And what is that? Dispute Resolution Committee to resolve the dispute amicably. Now, the DRC will seek to resolve the dispute through negotiations within one year. But this is extendable by six months. And it has to submit its report to the central government. But if a dispute cannot be settled by the dispute resolution committee, then what will happen? Central will refer it to the Interstate River Water Disputes Tribunal. So this tribunal will have multiple benches and this tribunal must give its decision within three years which may be extended by two years. And also the decision of the bench of the tribunal will be final and binding on the parties involved in the dispute. Now having seen the constitutional and legal provisions for interstate river water disputes, and issues associated with interstate river disputes. Now, let's discuss few futuristic solutions. Now in this, the first solution is positive politicization of the issue. How that the political discourse of regional identity and culture could be unraveled by bringing to public notice the development hindrances, economic losses, environmental degradation, resulting from a lack of solution to the dispute, rather portraying any issue as ethnic issue, like problem with politicization we have seen in Kaveri dispute, where it is framed as an ethnic identity issue between Tamilians and Kannadigas. Next solution is coordinated approach. Why? Because river basins are shared sources. So a coordinated approach between center and state is necessary for the preservation, equitable distribution, and sustainable utilization of river water. Next is incorporating social justice in dispute resolution. A river basin authority must develop adequate capacity for understanding the unique needs and realities emerging from the interplay of socio-economic factors. Last but not the least is robust institutional framework. A proposed law should be put on for consultation with the people and the state government. The government must have a process on how to present a robust institutional architecture as well as understand the significant changes on water flow and relation between groundwater and surface water before rushing to form the single tribunal. Now as we have seen, this issue required an approach from conflict to cooperation. Why? Because the current condition of interstate river water governance in India warrants a new approach for cooperative federalism and interstate water governance. In terms of identifying a unit of governance, river basins are the most appropriate. Why? Because they are located at the confluence of hydrology, geography and ecology. So river basins are frequently used as a proxy for ecosystem boundaries and a superior characterization than the gerrymandered mutable boundaries marked by the human on maps. So therefore, river basins have been declared essentially depoliticized spaces, citing scientific legitimacy and drawing nature into the question to simply override any other consideration. Now our next discussion is based on this article which appeared on page number 14 in the Hindu newspaper. According to this article, Stepping up from its ongoing initiative of providing portable water on six islands of Lakshadi using low temperature thermal desalinization, that is LTTD technology, the Chennai based National Institute of Ocean Technology, that is NIOT, is working at making this process 
free of emissions. Now, if you will trace the GS labors, technologies and their applications and effects in everyday life is important theme under GS paper 3. Also, if we will refer to UPSC mains previous year questions, it has been asking questions based on development and significance of the latest technologies which are being developed or used. Like in year 2020-20, it has asked questions based on solar energy. Similarly, in 2016, UPSC has asked questions based on sustainable use of water in agriculture. So here, in this discussion, we will look into the process of desalinization and various aspects like its significance and issues or challenges related to it. In later half of this DRS session, under prelims pointers, we will look into the details related to this particular project and technology being used therein. So let's start our session with the question, what is desalinization? Now desalinization is a process through which fresh water and potable water can be obtained from seawater by removing salts and other solutes from the later. This process typically involves several stages like pretreatment, membrane filtration and post-treatment. Now what is pretreatment? This is done to remove any large particle, debris or organic matter that could damage the delicate membranes used in the next stage. So what it involves? It involves filtration, sedimentation or flocculation to remove impurities. Now, the next stage of the process involves the use of membrane filtration to remove the remaining salts and minerals from the water. And what this stage involved? There are two main types of membrane filtration used in desalinization plant. The first is reverse osmosis. In this, water is forced through a semi-permeable membrane under high pressure which allows the water molecules to pass through but blocks the larger salt and mineral molecules. Second is electrodialysis. In this, electric current is used to separate the salt and minerals from water. Next stage is post-treatment. Now once the water has passed through membrane filtration stage, it undergoes post-treatment to ensure that it meets drinking water standards. Now what is this? This may involve adding chemicals to adjust the pH, disinfection with chlorine or other agents or additional filtration steps to remove any remaining impurities. So total there are three stages, pre-treatment, membrane filtration and post-treatment. Now let's look into other aspects of desalinization plants. Now the next question arises, what are the energy sources for desalinization plants? You should remember that these plants can be operated using a variety of energy sources including electricity, natural gas or renewable energy sources such as solar power etc. Now the choices of energy sources will depend on many conditions like local conditions, cost and availability. Now the next question is, what are its byproducts? Now, in addition to producing fresh water, desalination plants also produce a concentrated brine waste stream. And this must be disposed of safely. Why? Because this waste stream contains high levels of salt, minerals and chemicals that can be harmful to the environment if not handled properly. Now having seen what is desalinization, let's discuss few important aspects related to its significance. Now, one thing you should remember that these desalination plants are becoming increasingly important as a source of fresh water, particularly in regions that suffer from water scarcity due to natural factors such as arid climates, droughts or limited freshwater resources. So the importance of desalination so the importance of desalination plants can be summarized into the following. The first is providing a new source of water. Now desalination plants can provide a new source of water that was previously unusable. Why? Due to high salt content or contamination. 
so by removing salt or other impurities desalination plants can produce high quality drinking water agricultural irrigation water and industrial process water so this can be one of the solution for the water challenges faced by mega cities like chennai next is diversifying water supplies now it is important for communities and industries that rely heavily on a single source of water so desalination plants can provide an alternative source of water which is not affected by drought contamination or other factors that can impact fresh water supplies now as you know a deficit monsoon creates crises for cities which are purely dependent on reservoir single source for their water supply so this can be a viable solution next is supporting economic development now water scarcity can be significant barrier to economic development in certain regions so desalination plants can provide a reliable source of water that can support agriculture industry and tourism so what will happen these in turn create jobs and stimulate economic growth next is addressing climate change impacts now climate change is expected to exacerbate water scarcity in many regions of the world so desalination plants can provide a reliable source of water that is not impacted by droughts or other weather related events making them an important tool in adapting to the impacts of climate change last is promoting sustainability now desalination plants can be powered by renewable energy sources such as solar power wind power further reducing the reliance on fossil fuels and promoting sustainable development additionally the use of desalination can reduce the demand on fresh water resources promoting sustainable water management practices so overall desalination plants are an important tool for addressing water scarcity supporting economic development and promoting sustainability however it is important to design and operate desalination plants in a way that minimizes their environmental impact and maximizes their benefits to communities and industries also the very good case study for this is saudi arabia which is the largest producer of desalinated water in the world now having seen the important significance of desalination plants let's discuss few of its challenges now while desalination can be effective solution for water scarcity in certain regions there are some key issues associated with desalination plants that needed to be addressed the first is high energy consumption why because desalination plants require a large amount of energy to run the process most desalination plants use fossil fuels as their primary source of energy leading to greenhouse gas emissions and contributing to climate change second is cost desalination is an expensive process primarily due to high cost of energy and maintenance of the plants also the cost of building and operating a desalination plant can be prohibitive particularly for developing countries next issue is environmental impacts why because the brine or the salt water waste that is produced during the desalination process is often discharged back to the ocean which can harm marine life and ecosystem also the intake of sea water can also cause harm to aquatic life next challenge is concentrated waste disposal desalination plants produce a concentrated brine waste that is difficult to dispose of brine contains high level of salts and minerals and chemicals that can cause harm to the environment if not disposed of properly next issue is water scarcity desalination plants can create a false sense of security and lead to overuse of water resources instead of promoting conservation and sustainable water management practices desalination plants may encourage wasteful water use 
and excavate the water scarcity problem in the long run. So these are the issues associated with desalination plants. Now let's quickly see negative impacts of desalination on environment. So the first negative impact of desalinization on environment is that it is expensive and highly energy intensive. Also, discharge of hot and highly concentrated effluents into the sea, this changes ambient salinity. Also, it increases the temperature and it also introduces water currents in coastal regions. Another negative impact is large scale of greenhouse gas emissions which will further deteriorate our INDC commitments. Last but not the least is damage to the marine ecosystem. How? Due to algae bloom and migration of fish. The best case study for this is Chennai desalinization plants. Why? Because these plants are triggering changes along the coastline and reducing the availability of prawn, mackerel, etc. Now having seen what is desalinization, what are its significance and what are issues involved in the process. But with this, one thing you should understand that desalinization provides only short term solutions to the water stress. But sustainable solution lies in rejuvenating the natural resources of fresh water. It is also crucial to achieve SDG 6 that is clean water and sanitation. So in totality, Desalination is not a silver bullet solution for addressing water scarcity and sustainability issues. It should be considered as a last resort after all other options have been exhausted. Now, let's quickly see few important aspects related to low temperature thermal desalination technology in the form of true and false. So the first statement is the low temperature thermal desalination technology exploits the salinity difference between the surface and water at depths. This statement is false because this technology exploits the difference in temperature and not the salinity. That is nearly 15 degrees Celsius in ocean water at the surface in a depth of about 600 feet. So in this, the process involves evaporation of surface water. So what happened? The surface water which is warmer but whose pressure has been lowered using vacuum pumps. Such depressurized water can evaporate even at ambient temperatures. And this resulting vapor when condensed using cold water is free of salts and contaminants and fit to consume. So now let's come to the second statement. The process of low temperature thermal desalination technology eliminates need of diesel power and thus makes process fossil fuel free. Again, this statement is false. Why? Because need of diesel power to reduce the water pressure means that the process is not fossil fuel free and also consumes diesel. So both the statements are incorrect. Now our next discussion is based on this article which appeared on page number one in the Hindu newspaper. And context of this article is that on Thursday, both the Houses of Parliament put together a function for a little over 5 minutes with the ruling BJP unrelenting in its demand for an apology from Congress leader Rahul Gandhi and the opposition refusing to back down on the call for a joint parliamentary investigation into the Adani group controversy. The Lok Sabha worked for 2 minutes and 20 seconds in the pre lunch sitting and 50 seconds in the post lunch sitting. The Rajya Sabha functioned for 1 minute and 55 seconds in the morning and 40 seconds in the afternoon. As this article talks about parliament and you know that parliament and state legislatures, structure, functioning and conduct of business is an important theme under GS paper 2. So in this discussion, we will be looking into important questions like why is productivity of the parliament is important? Next, how do we know that the productivity is declining? and what is causing such a decline and we'll end our discussion with a way forward. So let's start our discussion. Now the first question is why is productivity of the parliament is important? The parliament of India is the supreme legislative body in the country and is responsible for enacting laws and overseeing the functioning of the government. The roles of parliament in India include the first one is lawmaking. 
This is the primary function of the parliament. As bills are introduced in either houses of the parliament, debated and discussed and finally passed as an act of parliament. Second is scrutiny of government. Parliament has the power to hold the government accountable. How? By asking questions, seeking clarifications and conducting debates on government policies and actions. Next important role is budgetary control. Parliament has the power to approve or reject the government's budget proposals and to scrutinize government spending. Another important role is oversight of executive. Parliament has the power to investigate and examine the functioning of the executive branch of the government and its various agencies. Next is electoral functions. Parliament has the power to decide on the qualifications and disqualifications of members, conduct elections, to fill vacancies and determine the electoral boundaries. Another important function is constitutional functions. Parliament has the power to amend the constitution, approve the proclamation of emergency and to impeach the president, vice president and other high officials. So overall, the roles of parliament in India are essential for maintaining the democratic system of the country and ensuring that the government is accountable to the people. Now, having seen the different roles of parliament in India, now let's come to the next question that is, how do we know that the productivity is declining? What are those parameters? As you know that there are few possible indicators that have been used to suggest that the parliamentary productivity is declining in India. Here are a few examples. The first one is number of bills passed. Now, according to data from PRS legislative research, the numbers of bills passed by Lok Sabha, that is the lower house of India's parliament, has declined in recent years. This you can see with the help of graph provided here. In the 16th Lok Sabha, that is 2014 and 19, a total of 205 bills were passed compared to 248 bills in the previous Lok Sabha, that is 2009 and 2014. In the current 17th Lok Sabha, only 17 bills have been passed so far. Next parameter is question R. One important aspect of the parliamentary productivity is the ability of MPs to ask questions of the government during question R. However, question R has been disrupted in recent years. How? With MPs often protesting and preventing the house from functioning. According to an analysis by India Spend, the 16th Lok Sabha lost 29% of its scheduled time due to disruptions, while the 17th Lok Sabha has lost 48% of its scheduled time so far. Next is Private Members Bill. As you know that these bills are introduced by MPs who are not part of the government. They are often seen as a way for backbenchers to contribute to the legislative process. However, the number of Private Members Bill being introduced and passed in Parliament has declined in recent years. According to PRS legislative research, only two private members bill were passed in 16 Lok Sabha compared to 14 in the previous Lok Sabha. So with this, it should be noted that these statistics are just few possible indicators of parliamentary productivity and there may be other factors at play as well. Additionally, it is important to consider the context in which these numbers are being presented as well as any potential biases in the data sources used. Now, having seen why is productivity of the parliament is important and what are the parameters on which its productivity can be gauged, now let's see a few reasons what is causing such a decline. Now, one of the primary factors is the increasing polarization and confrontational politics, which is leading to frequent disruptions in the house. MPs often engage in protests, sloganeering and walkouts which prevents the smooth functioning of parliament. This has resulted in the loss of valuable time and resources, hindering the legislative process. The best example of confrontational politics is paper spray politics in parliament in year 2014. Next reason is lack of preparation. Lack of 
adequate preparation and deliberation before introducing bills in parliament is another concern as government often rushes to pass bills without thorough discussions leading to inadequate scrutiny and oversight and this has resulted in poorly drafted legislation causing delays and controversies ultimately reducing productivity of parliament next is absence of robust committee system this is also one of the reason which has contributed to the declining productivity of parliament how now as you know committee plays a crucial role in scrutinizing bills conducting in depth research engaging in consultations with stakeholders which help in drafting effective legislation however the committee system in india is weak resulting in bypassing of committees and inadequate scrutiny of bills furthermore indian parliament lacks diversity with a significant underrepresentation of marginalized group such as women's religious minorities and this has resulted in the exclusion of diverse voices and perspectives leading to the passing of legislation that does not reflect the needs and aspirations of all sections of society so in conclusion several factors contribute to the declining parliamentary productivity in india including political polarization lack of adequate preparation weak committee system and lack of diversity addressing these issues is crucial to ensure effective governance and strengthen the democratic process in india so there are several ways to increase parliamentary productivity in india firstly there needs to be a greater focus on constructive and consensus based politics where members from different parties work together towards common goals this would reduce disruptions in the house and allows parliament to function more efficiently secondly there is needs to be a better preparation and scrutiny of bills before they are introduced in parliament this can be achieved by establishing a robust committee system that engages in in-depth research and consultations with various stakeholders such a system would ensure that bills are well drafted scrutinized thoroughly and adequately debated in parliament leading to more effective legislation thirdly indian parliament needs to focus on increasing diversity and representation particularly of a marginalized group such as women dalits and religious minorities this would ensure that the voices of all sections of society are heard and legislation reflects their needs and aspirations next there should be a focus on capacity building and training for parliamentarians particularly in areas such as legislative drafting public speaking and committee work this would enable mps to be more effective in their roles contributing to better legislative outcomes and increase productivity and the last is parliament should leverage technology to improve productivity such as using electronic voting system enabling remote attendance for members and enhancing digital communication channels this would enable parliament to function more efficiently reduce disruptions and save valuable time and resources so in conclusion increasing parliamentary productivity in india requires a multi faceted approach including constructive and consensus based politics better presentation better preparation and scrutiny of bills greater diversity and representation capacity building for parliamentarians leveraging technology so by adopting these measures india can strengthen its democratic institutions and ensure effective governance for all its citizens that's all for today Stay tuned for more such updates.